Hi, my name is Steve Adams, pastor of Eastgate Bible Church, and this is the Discipleship Training School. The Discipleship Training School is an eight-week course designed to challenge and equip Christians to faithfully be obedient to the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. Each of these eight sessions will have some video teaching material, but there'll be times throughout the videos to stop and pause and there are discussion questions provided for you to discuss those in a group or if you're working through this on your own uh, just to think through those things before uh, proceeding with the video material. All of our materials for the Discipleship Training School are available freely online at our website www.eastgatebiblechurch.com and um, they're free for people at Eastgate to use, they're free for anybody anywhere in the world to use. If you think it would be a helpful resource for your church, you don't need to ask permission. You may take, use, adapt, whatever you like, and use it totally free of charge. At the moment, we are running through this course with all of our community groups. Um, but when we're finished running it through with our community groups, we'll also place online, in addition to the videos and the discussion questions, which are already there, we'll also put up the, the training notes, uh, the leader's guide, as well as the PowerPoint slides. But if at any chance you would like to view that material beforehand, uh, just send us an email and we'll happily send that out to you. Over the eight sessions, this is the material that we're going to be covering in our Discipleship Training School. Today in our first session, we're just looking at the basics, defining our terms, what is a disciple and what is discipleship. Next session, we're going to look at why we should be making disciples, but also looking at the reasons why we don't make disciples. In our third session, we're going to look at healthy heart values for effective disciple makers. In our fourth session, we're going to look at forming healthy habits that are conducive to disciple making. In our fifth session, we're going to look at Jesus and how he is the model of discipleship. In the sixth and seventh session, we're going to look at the, the practical how-to of discipleship. Now, I know there's going to be some people who think, why do we wait to sessions six and seven before we get into how do we make disciples? And the reason for that is that we need to lay the foundations, not just defining the terms, but we need to have the right heart for the right things in order to have any chance of acting in the right manner, in the right way before God and before others. So that's why um, we've structured things this way. In our eighth session, we're going to look at discipleship within community and missional communities. And then a little bit later on, we're going to have a ninth session, which I'll be answering specific questions that have been raised in our community groups here at Eastgate Bible Church. So each of those will be released uh, week after week, with the exception of that Q&A session, which will just take a couple of extra weeks um, until it's completed. Now, I'm someone who really enjoys learning things from online videos, whether it's a, a cooking thing, uh, whether it's a technology thing. I've learned a lot of things through YouTube and other places like that. But I've noticed there's also been a recent trend to create instructional videos for things that don't need instructions for. We're talking about instructional videos like how to make homemade ice or how to cook toast. Now, I don't believe anybody has ever had a formal lesson in either of those things. There was no point that I can remember where my mum sat me down and said, Steve, I think you're old enough now. I think now is the time we're going to show you how to make ice, how to make toast. Now, in those instructional videos, they're, they're funny. They've got the basics there, but they throw in a few fancy things like using a rubber spatula and you're making the ice to make sure all your water levels are entirely even. But the point is, we know we don't need instructions for those things. In fact, none of us can probably think of a time where someone sat us down and explained how to do them. They are basic foundational things that we see people doing around us every single day, and we just simply learn from observing them. And there's lots of basic things in life that we learn purely by observing what others do around us because we see it time and time again. Anyone with children will know that sometimes your children learn things that you've never taught them. Now, sometimes that'll be a real encouragement to you to see that they've picked up something from you just by watching and you think, wow, how great is that? They've picked up on that. There's other times you're going to be dramatically embarrassed because they've replicated something else that they've observed in your behavior and they've gone and done the same thing. The point that I want to make is, though, 
is that if discipleship is so basic and foundational to who we are as Christians, then we shouldn't need a course like this because when we're hanging out with other Christians, these things should be observable in the natural patterns of everyday life. However, the reality is that's not what we see in our churches. The basic command of the Great Commission to go and make disciples is largely missing in the majority of our churches. So that's one of the reasons why this course needs to exist. One of the other reasons why people aren't learning, observing from one another is that as we're about to see, just defining the basic terms of what it is, is a disciple, what does it mean to make disciples, what is discipleship, you'll see that everyone's got such a large spectrum of ideas on those things because they've read different material, I've heard different things taught. But I would imagine if we just purely looked at the Bible, we probably wouldn't have such a um, wide range of ideas of how these things look. So discipleship and disciple making, they are so essential to who we are as Christians. And one of the foundations in the scriptures of which this is based upon is Jesus and his great commission in Matthew 28. And by the end of this course, if you haven't memorized it, you probably sure will do. So let's read from verses 16 right through to verse 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus has risen from the dead. The disciples see him and rightly they worship him. They realize he is one who is worthy of worship. And he announces to them, all authority has been given to me. That means all authority over them, all authority over us, all authority over every single thing. And the one with all authority says, here's my mission I'm sending you out on. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And not only does he say, I've got all authority, I'm sending you on this mission, but the one who has all authority says, my presence will go with you all the way till the end of the age. And you think, surely no Christian's not going to take up this mission. The one with all authority who's going to be with us has sent it out on, on this mission. Yet largely the church has dropped the ball on everyday one on one discipleship. It should be so central like toast and making ice that we observe it all the time, that we're being challenged and encouraged in it. And I'd love to see that happen within Eastgate, and I'd love to see that happen in any churches that are looking at this material. But the first thing I want to do is to look at what do our terms mean. We're about to see that people have very different definitions of what is a disciple, what is disciple making, what does it look to disciple someone. So take time to, to pause your video and answer the questions that come up on your screen now. So firstly, what is a disciple? You have probably just discovered that in your group you have a very wide range of ideas and perceptions of what it means to be a disciple. Now some of that will be shaped by things that you've read, sermons that you've heard, or things that you've seen practiced around you. I'd imagine most of your diversity came in, what does it look like to make disciples, or what does it look like to disciple someone? And I think probably some of those things that people may have mentioned, maybe things that are part of the greater picture of discipleship, but may not actually be discipleship in and of itself. But you can imagine the problems if we just jumped in, we just presumed everyone was on the same page, it would mean that throughout the rest of this course, anytime I use these terms, people would hear totally different things. So it's important that we begin by establishing and defining our terms that we're going to use throughout each of the course. So when we looked at the question of what is a disciple, Here are what I believe are going to be the most common answers that you would have had in your group. Firstly, one of the 12 men that Jesus spent a lot of time with. Secondly, a follower of Jesus. Thirdly, a learner. Or fourthly, just in general terms, a Christian. Now, it's true that the Bible speaks of 12 disciples. 
who work closely with Jesus, or sometimes just refers to them as the twelve, but it would be a very wrong idea to say that the term disciple exclusively belongs to these twelve men. To give you just one example, take a look with me from Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from the twelve whom he named apostles. So Jesus gathers a large group of people who he calls disciples. Then out of this larger group of disciples, he chooses twelve. So the term was never meant to de define just twelve specific men who had a close personal walk with Jesus. It's used in a very broad ways throughout the rest of the Bible. Now someone in your group may have said a follower. And that's a really good answer to give, especially when you consider how did Jesus invite his disciples into discipleship? What we see is his words to them is to follow me. But the Greek term translated disciple simply just means a learner, meaning one who learns. Now, I want us to take away any possible notion of being a learner of Jesus just means to learn more things about him. It certainly involves that, but it goes far wider than that. If we were to look at the complete word study dictionary of the New Testament, part of its definition of this term explains it like this. It means not only to learn, but to become attached to one's teacher and become his follower in doctrine and conduct of life. So to be a learner of Jesus is not just to learn about him, but to learn to become like him. Just like James says in his letter, knowing things or believing things without putting into action is a complete void waste of time. The things that we believe should shape and form the ways in which we live. We don't want to just learn about Jesus. We want to be transformed to become like Jesus. Yet we cannot become like Jesus if we don't first know what Jesus is like. So it's key that we understand this before we continue in this course, looking at what discipleship is. We need to ask the question, are we just going to go through this course and be educated and learn things about discipleship? Or is it our heart that God would so change us that we would not only learn about Jesus, but learn to become more like Jesus and join with him in his mission to make disciples of all nations. Now, as evangelicals, we love to dig deep into the Word of God. But if all we're going to do is expand our knowledge of things about discipleship, it really is a waste of time. In fact, if we're doing anything, if we're learning more things, then we are held accountable to more things. We're actually piling up judgment for ourselves to learn things and not put them into practice. We don't want to just build our mind. We want to be transformed to become more like Jesus. I don't want us to be like the Pharisees who Jesus interacted with in John chapter 5 saying, You search the scriptures because you think in them that you have eternal life. Yet it is they that bear witness about me. Learning itself is never the goal of the scriptures. Transformation and transformation to be more like Jesus, to see him and to become more like him is always the goal. And it is our prayer as we begin this course that we would see Jesus and we would desire to come more like Jesus that we wouldn't just want to be building up our knowledge. And I'll just suggest that we pause and pray together in a group uh, that we, God would form us a heart that desires to see Jesus. Now, the fourth answer that I think that you may have given to the answer of what is a disciple is to simply say a Christian. And it's a fair thing to say because Christians are by nature supposed to be characterized by being disciples, being learners of Jesus and being learners who become more like Jesus. But God is not interested just in converts. He's not just interested in people becoming into the Christian club or people making decisions. We see the command of the Great Commission isn't to make converts, isn't to make Christians, but it is to make disciples. Let's remind ourselves of the words of the Great Commission once again, looking at verses just 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So as the twelve are being sent to make disciples of all nations, we also have a description which accompanies that. The first part of the descriptions of what it looks like to make disciples, he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this tells us that discipleship includes evangelism. Because if a disciple is a learner of Jesus, you need to first learn about Jesus to come to know and trust in him as your savior. And part of making a disciple is when someone comes to faith is that you um, baptize them. But what we see here is in the Bible, there is no such thing as an unbaptized disciple. As you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a disciple. And one of the characteristic things of that is that you are baptized. And even though this isn't the focus of what we're here to discuss at this point in time, but if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you have not yet been baptized, then I already encourage you to think about why you haven't taken that step of obedience to Jesus. And also to discuss with the leadership in your church if you're interested in getting yourself baptized. Now, that's not our focus here. So let us return back to the second description of what it looks like to make disciples. He says, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. So discipleship is not just about a, a five minute exchange. To teach someone everything that God has commanded us is going to take a bit of time. Um, so it involves a life on life type of relationship, like just like Jesus had with his, with his 12 disciples. And that teaching them to obey all that I have commanded includes the command he has just given to make disciples. So to summarize the Great Commission, Jesus is saying, now guys, you know what I've done with you over these last three years? Now I want you to go and do that with other people and to train and teach them to do it with other people and so on and so on. So disciples are baptized. And the disciples are growing and being taught all that Jesus has commanded. It's not just taught factually, but taught to obey and walk in these things. So a disciple is a learner of Jesus, both in doctrine and in conduct. In session five, we're going to look specifically at Jesus and how he discipled the 12 disciples uh, to learn some basic principles for him as a model of discipleship. Now, secondly, we're now going to look at what is discipleship? Like if a disciple is a learner of Jesus, then effectively in its broadest sense, discipleship is the culmination of everything which contributes to that end of helping us learn more about Jesus and helping us learn to become more like Jesus. The elders of Eastgate Bible Church are currently working through a book called The Vine Project by Colin Marshall and Tony Payne where the basic premise of the book is thinking about how we, everything we do as a church can be built around the framework of discipleship, how we can structure our ministries, our goals and intentions around everyone from the person furthest from Christ to the maturest Christian. What can we be doing to reach them and help bring them a little bit closer to Jesus? Now, while the whole discipleship can refer to the whole spectrum of things that contribute to us learning Jesus and to become like Jesus, this course in particular will be focusing more so on one-on-one, life-on-life -on -life, or one-on-some personal discipleship. But it would be wrong to say that what we're talking about here is the entirety of what is involved in discipleship. It would also be equally wrong to say this material we're talking about is not what you and I and every Christian is called to do. This is part of what we are called to do as the results and consequences of the Great Commission. But when I say that discipleship is the culmination of all things which contribute to us learning Jesus and learning to become like Jesus, even something like a sermon could be part of of our overall discipleship, just a, a part of it, not a, its entirety. So what I want you to do now is to pause your video, answer the question on the screen where I've asked you to list everything that you can think of outside of personal one-to-one -one discipleship that may contribute to your overall discipleship.
Now I can imagine there's probably, again, a variety of things which have been raised within the group. It could be things like reading your Bible, prayer, church attendance, submitting to your elders, uh, being a member of a church, being baptized, being involved in a small group, being discipling within, you, within your family. All of these things and many more things contribute to the bigger, larger picture of our discipleship, to learn Christ and to be learn to become Christ. But I also want to ask another question because sometimes these terms get um, used interchangeably and I don't think necessarily they should do. Evangelism and discipleship. I want us to pause and think what is the similarities between the two and in what ways do they differ? So pause your video and answer the question that's on your screen now. It's often expressed that evangelism is what we do before a person knows Jesus, and then discipleship is what we do to teach someone after they become a Christian. But both of those premises are actually wrong. Take, for example, the example of Jesus. When he calls his disciples, does he bring them to salvation and then disciple them to teach them? No, he just calls them as they are. And as he calls them, they come to learn who Jesus is and what he's about. Now, we don't know exactly at what point the disciples came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. There's moments when they appear to be getting part of it, but then there are other moments when it looks like they've got no idea um, what Jesus is actually on about. Use P Peter's example. Like when he's asked, Jesus asks him, who do you think I am? He gets off to a great start. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But then just go down a couple of verses from verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So Peter comes to a really right conclusion about who Jesus is. But when Jesus explains the core of what he's come to do, you see, Peter doesn't really get it and understand it. Even when Jesus was said he was going to be raised on the third day, we see all of the disciples um, not expecting him to be raised. They're hiding in a building for fear of the Jews. So we don't know at what point they came to saving faith, but it's very clear that the call to discipleship includes the, the outcome of evangelism, of teaching people about Christ in order that may, they may trust in him. I'd like to illustrate this wrong thinking between evangelism and discipleship up on your screen. So here we see it illustrated on the left, where before someone comes to faith, we speak about doing the evangelism, presenting the gospel to them. And then on the right, we talk about after they come to faith, that at that point we begin to do discipleship. But as we've already seen with Jesus, the first thing he does is he calls people to himself and then through that process of discipleship, they learn who he is and what he's going to do and what he has done. Then they come to trust in him. So evangelism is part of discipleship, not something which comes before discipleship. I mean, after all, consider the Great Commission, which we'll look at many times throughout this course. Jesus' last command wasn't to go and evangelize all nations. His command was to go and make disciples of all nations because discipleship includes the call to teach people Christ so they may trust in him as their savior. The other area is this, is that we make the mistake of presuming that the gospel is only for people before they come to faith in Christ. And that's not true. Consider the word of Paul to the Colossians in Colossians 2 verses 6 and 7. Therefore, just as you've received Jesus Christ the Lord, so continue to walk in him, rooted and built it up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding with thanksgiving. The same way in which we started, by the gospel, we are to continue to walk by the same 
gospel truths. The gospel isn't a one-off thing for us. It's the very means which defines who we are as a Christian and how we are to walk and live day by day. Paul expressed this ongoing dependence upon the gospel to the Corinthian church. Read with me 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 2. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul speaks of the gospel in three separate ways. He says, the gospel that you received, past tense, by which you stand, present tense, and by which you are being saved, ongoing, as in the process of sanctification, of, of Jesus working within us by his spirit to make us more like him. So we do need the gospel. The gospel is not just something before we come to know Jesus to bring us to know him. It's something which defines who we are and how we live every moment of our life. I need to preach the gospel to myself daily, and every single one of us needs to preach the gospel to ourselves daily. The way which this diagram should look like is up here on your screen, where we see discipleship covers the full spectrum to the person furthest from Christ, and thinking what can we do to reach them, to help them learn about Jesus, to learn to move closer towards Jesus, and every way through to the most mature Christian, discipleship and growth by means of the gospel is what we're all about from beginning to end. Jesus' parting commands wasn't to build churches, wasn't to have youth groups, wasn't to have small groups, it was to make disciples, and to make disciples which would multiply and impact the world. So to wrap things up, a disciple is a learner of Christ, a learning about him to become like him. And discipleship in its broader sense is the culmination of everything which contributes to us learning about Christ to become like him. And everywhere from the beginning of the first call to the first 12 disciples, the command is to go make disciples of all nations baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that he has commanded them. And part of that command to teach them to obey all he's commanded includes to teach them to make disciples. It's to be perpetual. In our next session, we're going to look at why we should make disciples, but also we're going to address the question of what are the reasons that are keeping so many from making disciples and hopefully we can do that in an encouraging way that actually helps you see your need to make disciples and also too to undo some of those fears which we may have. It might seem a little bit odd to address the question of why we don't make disciples when something seems so clear cut. Jesus says he's got all authority, he promises his presence with us so he sends it out. This is his mission enabled by his power but for some reason there are things that are keeping us back and we'll look at those next week. I want to consider an example which Francis Chan uses quite regularly, and it's the example of the game Simon Says, a game we're all familiar with, where someone stands at the front and they say, Simon Says, and they tell you to do something, maybe it's uh, pat your head and rub your belly, and then everybody does it. And I want us to ponder the stupidity of this. Simon is a fictitious character, he doesn't exist, he's got no authority, and he's got no relationship to you whatsoever. Yet somehow, when Simon says something, we automatically do it just like that. However, we don't seem to have the same response to Jesus says. When Jesus has been risen from the dead, says he's got all authority in heaven and on earth, and he's promised his presence with us, so he sends us out on his mission by his power to go make disciples of all nations. And then I wonder, whose voice do we listen to more readily? unknown Simon or our Savior who has laid down his life for us, rescued us from an eternal judgment, help us to be one of God's very own children. And he just commands us, go make disciples of all nations. That should be the desire of our heart. And I pray that God would work within us to that effect. Uh, this is the end of the first session for the Discipleship Training School. There are some questions which are about to appear on your screen to discuss and pray for one another in your group, and I'll see you back in the next session.